is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you, who trust you, who put their hope in you. Lord Almighty, we thank you that you are a defender, a protector, and a stronghold for the oppressed and the weak. And we pray that our many brothers and sisters around the world today who are in war-torn cities and dangerous nations, that you would be their comfort and their strength in this hour. We do pray for peace between Israel, Gaza. We do pray for peace between Russia, Uzbekistan. We pray for peace in Syria. and comfort for all the families who are still mourning the many plane crashes that happened last week. And Father, we also pray for our neighbors, our Muslim neighbors today, as they conclude their fast over Ramadan, their time of seeking greater spiritual maturity. We ask that even now, that Jesus, you would reveal yourself as Lord and Savior in their lives. And that even in Itaewon and throughout this nation, that there would be a revival of salvation amongst our Muslim neighbors. That they would no longer just be neighbors, but one day they would be brothers and sisters in the faith. And God, we also want to thank you for protecting the neck of Justin. That it was not a complete break. But also, Lord, we pray against any further complications. We ask that you would fuse his bones together strongly. that you would bring about a quick and complete healing to his neck in Jesus' name. And Father, we also want to pray that you would bring great comfort to the hearts and minds of J.C., his mother, his sister, his family members as they grieve the loss of their father today. That you would hold them close to your hearts that they would know that they are not mourning alone, but that you are a God of compassion, that you weep with those who weep. And God, give us that same heart for this family today. And in the days and months and years to come, as grief comes like waves, when it comes harder than other days, would you give them divine strength to carry on, hoping, trusting, knowing that there is a day of reunion and resurrection that we will experience. So Father, comfort this family and flood their hearts with your gracious love for them. And God, I ask for strength now. that you would speak through me words of life, changing lives, saving the lost, strengthening your church here. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, Don was uh, in his late 50s, and he has been serving in a rural church in Indiana Uh, for quite a number of years. And he said this recently, I've served my church for the past 27 years, and I've grown that church from 150 people when I first came to 24 people today. The treasurer just called me last week and told me that we will run out of money in August. It looks like we're going to have to shut our doors for good. What do I have to show for the life of almost three decades 
of serving God. His face was covered with anger, confusion, resentment, not knowing what to do next. But it was also clear that he had no more fights in him. He was burnt out and he had given up the fights. But his biggest hurdle, he said, was feeling like a failure before God, before his wife, before his children, before his church. What would you say to Don? You know, our world is wired for celebrating the bigger, the better, the brighter lights of Hollywood success stories. And we have bought into the world's definition and the world's standard of success to be our measuring rod for what to strive after for the church as well. You know, in the U.S., there are about 300,000 churches nationwide. But the average attendance is about 75 people. Almost 180,000 churches in America have less than 100 people. So about 60% of the country uh, ha is basically comprised of small churches. So America is actually a country of small churches. But we don't think like that when we think about churches in the U.S. But because of media, we elevate the few large churches thinking that they are the norm. There are about 1,500 megachurches in the U.S., meaning less than one-half of one percent of all churches in the U.S. would be considered a megachurch. And so the pressures to be like the big-name pastors and the big-name churches deals a crushing blow to many regular Joes like you and me. In fact, podcasts today have become both a blessing and a curse to a lot of churches and pastors. Um, you know, it's a blessing because we get to hear from phenomenal speakers from all over the world. And it's a curse because now congregation members listen to them and they compare you to those phenomenal speakers from all over the world. That has led to a lot of disillusioned and discouraged pastors uh, who are leading the church today. I think in light of all that we have learned throughout this series of praying for your pastor, we've heard a lot of horrific stats, sad stories. We heard a lot concerning their pain, the silence, the burnout, the betrayal, and even the 1,500 pastors who leave the ministry every month in the United States. And in light of all these things, and I still most recently read a, a new book that came out called Fail, uh, Dealing with Ministry Failure uh, for Pastors. And that shed also new light into the series that we've been doing. And in light of that, I realized we needed to pray for one more important thing before we end the series, and that is to pray for healing and restoration for pastors and their families. You know, I actually received some uh, interesting feedback from a number of PKs and MKs after last week's sermon. Uh, PKs who resonated so much with what was discussed and I was blessed also to hear that quite a number of PKs and MKs felt led to forgive their parents after last week's message, to forgive their fathers and their mothers uh, for the hurt that they experienced of feeling left out uh, because of their focus upon ministry. And so reflecting, reflecting upon all of these things, I felt the need to offer up one more gift to pastors in the form of asking the church to pray for them, and uh, that is to pray for their healing and their restoration. And so we want to explore this topic today, and we will pray through a familiar parable also about healing and restoration, the parable of the prodigal son from Luke 15. So turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 11, 11 and following. And again, not all of the verses are in your outline, so please open your Bibles or turn on your iPads or whatever you want to do. But don't be surfing the Internet while you do that. God is here. And he is watching. Right? No. Um, let's see, where were we? Yes, Luke 15, verse 11 and following. And let's uh, begin our look 
And Lord willing, I'm pretty sure that this will be the conclusion of our series, How to Pray for Your Pastor. Uh, but you never know. I'm always open to following the Spirit's lead. So let's look at Luke 15 from verse 11. It says, And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed <clears throat> excuse me, with the pods that the pigs ate, <clears throat> and no one gave him anything. So this brief paragraph is filled with a lot of parallels of our lives, uh, but also the lives of PKs, pastor kids, and even the lives of pastors. Now, uh, let's look at what is going on here. And it begins with a younger son uh, making a very peculiar request of his father. The younger one wants to explore life outside of home. Right? And so that's kind of the desire that a lot of high school seniors have right before they leave for college. They just want their freedom. They want to be out of the, uh, the ruling authority of their parents. They just want to call their own shots. They want to live their own life. And that's the spirit behind the request here. And so he wants to experience life outside of his father's house. And in essence, he says, Dad, you know, you're a rich guy. And I love the fact that you're rich, and I know that when you die, I'm going to have a lot of inheritance. But you know what, Dad? I can't wait until you die. And so why don't you uh, just give me what's coming to me, give me my share of the inheritance, and just let me live. And just leave me alone. And so just give me you know, what's coming to me, and just let me get out of here. Um, that's pretty insulting no matter what culture you're from. But especially if you were to say that in Korean culture, the Korean dad would be like, yeah, come over here. I'll, I'll give you what's coming to you. Uh, let, let me give you what's coming to you. Right? Um, but graciously, the father does give him what he asks for. And like our father in heaven too, God does not force us to be with him. And God does not force us to love him. He knows that true love is a choice. It, is, it involves freedom. And so he gives his son the freedom to go the way that he wants. And as some have often uh, said as well, that we are as close as we want to be to God today. But then he says this in this, uh, we see in the, these verses, it says that in the midst of going to this distant country and living it up the way that he wanted to, uh, he squandered his property in reckless living. So he lived it up, he partied it up, and he wasted it all. He's broke now, and then it says, there was a famine in the land. And so he began to be in need, as it says in verse 14. Because sometimes, God will let us lose all that we have, so that we realize he is all that we need. And that's kind of what's happening to the son now. Look at verse 15 and 16 again. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fee fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. And so now as a Jew, this is both embarrassing and shameful. Uh, pigs were considered unclean animals. Uh, so the fact that he not only was working with pigs... Uh, but he, it says that he was longing to eat what the pigs were being fed, meaning he was really at the low of lows in so many ways. But then it says, but no one gave him anything. So he is alone. He realizes the consequences of his sins, of his mistakes, of his selfish attitude towards his father, of his rebellious attitude that left him running away from home. He feels like a failure, and he feels like he has messed up, and there is nowhere else to turn. But in the midst of feeling 
like a failure, in the midst of realizing he's messed up, there's something that we need to understand and that is, that is exactly how a lot of pastors feel today as well. They know they've messed up. They know they've failed. And they feel like there's nothing left to do and nowhere else to go. And so in light of this, in light of the reality of the high, high percentage of 70 plus percentage of pastors in this world who struggle with discouragement and depression on a weekly, if not daily basis, there is one more gift that we want to give to the pastors of our generation through prayer, and that is to pray for their healing and their restoration. So follow along with me in your outlines, and I want to guide us through a few topics that we could pray through. One more thing that I'd like for us to pray about is to pray for a return. So everyone repeat, pray for a return. All right, so we want to pray for a return uh, in many ways. Uh, let's look at Luke 15 from verse 17. But when he came to himself, or in other translations it says, when he came to his senses, when he realized, what in the world have I done? What in the world is going on with my life? When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? And so again, he's, he just wishes he could eat what the pigs are eating. And he's thinking, wait a second, the servants who work at my father's place, they eat much better than anybody I see here. But I perish here with hunger. Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. So this is the turning point in the story. When the son realizes that he has hit rock bottom. And it's time to return home. This is also a picture of a heart beginning to repent. He sees the condition of his life. The effects of sin. And he wants change. And so he turns to the father. He also sees the goodness of his father in a new light. His father has always been good to him, but he just took it for granted. He never realized how gracious his father was. And he begins to understand how gracious his father really was. And so now he is changing how he thinks, what he desires, and that is affecting a new course of action. That is repentance. When we change how we think, what we desire, and that changes the direction of our steps, how we live. Repentance ultimately means a change of mind. Changing how we think about sin, about what we desire, and it is turning away from our sin and returning to Him. But ultimately, repentance, the heart of it, the heart of repentance, is grounded in a relying on the mercies and the grace, graciousness and the goodness of God. It is banking my life, not on what I have done because I've messed up. It is banking my future hope on the grace of God. That is where my hope lies. And that's a good place to be. And we want to do that today. We want to pray that many prodigals would return to the father as well. For the child who ran away, yes, but also for the child who lived like a slave. And for the pastor also who lived life apart from the security of knowing that he too is a child of God in heaven. Pray that they would return to God the father in heaven by knowing the true heart of the father. But I also realize the reason why we need to pray this for the pastors as well is that especially for those pastors who have fell morally or for those who feel like a failure in ministry because they are being compared to the mega churches. They are being compared to the most gifted speakers of this generation. And as people compare them to these great pastors and speakers around the world, they feel smaller and smaller and more and more insignificant in their own roles. So for these pastors, we want to pray 
that they would return to the Father by knowing God's heart for them too. You see, it's hard. Uh, when you've been serving the Lord for all these years and you fail or you are pushed out of ministry, it is hard when you feel like you've disappointed God. And so we want to pray that they would return to the Lord by knowing that God's love for them is not based on their service to them. You see, not all pastors understand the gospel either. Not all pastors also live in light of the gospel either. Because there are some people who enter ministry out of duty. Some people enter ministry out of debt, meaning uh, I know a lot of people where this is the case. Their family member was sick and they promised, God, if you heal this person, I'll go into ministry. Or they were sick when they were young and their parents prayed or they prayed, God, if you make me better, I will serve you as a pastor for all my days. And God heals them. And they feel indebted that I have to do this in order to pay back God. So there are a lot of ministers who are ministering not out of the overflow and response of grace, but out of debt and duty. Uh, and so we want to pray that the gospel would infiltrate into their hearts as well. Amen? That they would know that success in God's eyes is not about attendance numbers or offering numbers. That they would believe what we preach about the gospel. That only through the work of Christ do we gain acceptance into the embrace of the Father in heaven, not because of what we do. And for the many workaholics, pray for a return as Malachi 4, 6 speaks of, that the hearts of children would turn back to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers would turn back to the children. We need to pray for a heart change in this generation for families, for parents, for children. You see, the number one regret that pastors have in all these surveys was not spending enough time with their family because of the demands that they placed upon them or the ministry placed upon them. And one PK, one pastor's kid that I knew, that I was friends with growing up, she said the reason why she got into the drug scene, the reason why she hung out with people that her parents disapproved of, the reason why she slept around and let her parents find out about a lot of the stuff that she did, the reason why she did so many things in direct rebellion against her parents' wishes was because in her words, negative attention was better than no attention. She felt that the only way that she could get the parents' attention and get them to talk to her was when they were screaming at her. She said, that's the only time that they would focus their attention on me. Because if I was a good girl, if I did what they wanted, I never saw them, I never heard from them. And that turned out to be the case for a lot of people during their rebellious periods. It was a cry for someone to notice them. But all of us need to be aware of the effects of being absent in the lives of our children, be it physically or emotionally. When the role and responsibility that God gave to fathers and mothers is neglected, there are dangerous consequences that result. You see, the absence of a parent, but especially the absence of a father in the life of a child, has a huge impact in how children develop as they grow older. According to studies, children who are raised without the influence of a father have two to three times more behavioral and psychological problems than children who are raised by both parents. 70% of those who are incarcerated in youth detention and youth jails, 70% of these children and youth were raised without a father. And boys who grow up without a dad, they're twice as likely to end up in jail than boys who grow up with fathers. So studies make it clear that there is a connection between a father's presence and the impact of behavioral development within a child. Now get this study statistic that was done. 63% of youth suicides 
are from fatherless families. Now, this stat really intrigued me, and it made me wonder the impact of Korean work culture, where most many times the father spends way too many hours at the office apart from the family, how the absence of the father, be it through workaholic schedules or through divorce, is impacting the suicide rates within this country. Because if you did not hear, um, it's high amongst teens, but the number one cause of death for people in their 20s in Korea is suicide. And so concerning these stats that were done in the United States, where fatherless families, it has a direct impact on what happens to their aggressive nature uh, in terms of juvenile detention, but also for suicide. I can't help but wonder how that has been connected for the culture of Korea as well. So we need to pray for a return and for the fathers to come home as well. Canadian scientists concluded that growing up in a fatherless household can permanently alter the brain, causing more aggressive behavior. This was a study that was uh, released last year, that the effects are both damaging to the brain development of both sons and daughters. Boys don't know what it means to be a gentleman because it was never modeled for them. And girls don't know how to recognize good values in a guy when they start dating and or if they get married. And for girls especially, they found it to be very impactful, the absence of a father in their upbringing. There was an increase in depression amongst women. Uh, there was an increase in promiscuity, failed relationships, and addictions. You see, God created families to be a father and a mother, loving, discipling, disciplining, and raising children together. And when that order is broken, the health and the growth of a family is at risk, is what these studies concluded. Now, the reason why I mention this is because there are many in this nation and many in the churches, in ministry families, who grow up without a dad. Some because of divorce, but most because of emotional absence. That leads to children growing up longing for the embrace of a father. It results in a child who may have a dad, but in their hearts feel just like an orphan, without a dad to love them and to lead them. And so we need to pray for prodigal children and even prodigal parents to come home and for healing to begin. Amen? It's an important element of church life that doesn't get discussed, therefore, it doesn't get prayed for. And so we need to pray for healing and restoration for the pastors in this regard. Pray for a return home. Amen? Also, not only that, we should pray for restoration. So everyone repeat, pray for restoration. Let's look at Luke 15, starting from verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quit, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Verse 20 says, While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. This tells us that the father was waiting for him. That he was looking out into the distance. Since the day that his son left, I'm sure he was waiting outside 
the front door, looking across the fields, looking in the distance, and day after day, looking and wondering, there is somebody coming, is that him? And then he is heartbroken, that is not my son. But this day, as he is looking into the distance, he sees another shadowy figure coming, but he is thinner than what he remembers his son to be. And as he comes a little bit closer, he realizes, though his eyes are old and they're fading, he can recognize his son, and then he runs to him. You see, in that culture, old people don't run out of respect. But he didn't care about being respected in the eyes of people. He cared about being reunited with his son. And that is a beautiful picture of God's heart for the sinner who turns back to him. That when we take that one step back in God's direction, God, our Father, will run the rest of the way. Because he's been waiting for you to return since the day that you left. And when you take that one step back, when you pray that one prayer of repentance to turn back to him, God will run the rest of the way. Not to hit you, not to abuse you. It says his heart was filled with compassion. He ran to embrace him. That is the heart of our Father in heaven. We've talked about it before. I know some of you have had bad fathers, absent fathers, but we can learn from example, but also we can learn through contrasts. And for all of you who have had distant and abusive fathers, we learn about God our Father in heaven through the contrast that God is nothing like the painful, abusive experience that you had growing up. Amen. The son is repentant, returns home, and the father receives him and restores him. He gives him the best robe, a ring for his finger, shoes for his feet. The robe and the ring signify his rightful status as a son. He was being restored to his proper place as royalty in the family. You see, this is what the gospel does when Satan throws shame in our face. It reminds us of our identity as deeply loved children of God. You see, guilt says, I failed, which reveals I was wrong in my action. Just like in a courtroom. If you're found guilty, it it proves I was wrong in the action that I did of stealing, killing, whatever. But shame, if guilt says, I failed, shame says, I am a failure. And that reveals an issue with my identity. And that's what Satan likes to target. He likes to target our identity and make us think that we, just like this prodigal son, we are unworthy to be called your son or daughter anymore. Shame pushes down not just what we do, but who we are. But the gospel reminds us of who we are because of whose we are, that we belong to him, that your identity is never based on what you do. Your new identity in Christ is based on what Christ has done for us. Therefore, in Christ, you are significant. You matter. You are loved. That though you fail, you are not a failure. That that through faith in Christ, all our failures and sins were placed on him. And he gives us instead his righteousness, acceptance, sonship, and even salvation. God is in the business of restoration. And he desires to restore you so that you know that though you failed, that is not who you are. You are royalty because of what Jesus has done for you. And when you approach him in faith to honestly and humbly confess your sins before the Lord, he takes the filthy rags that we have soiled through our sin And he places the robe of righteousness that was bought for us through his son, Jesus Christ. God is in the business 
of healing and restoration of things that we have lost. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, the great army which I sent among you. God can heal. God can restore years, decades, relationships, families, marriages. Because his love is wider. His love is deeper. His love is stronger than anything that we can do, than anything that we have been through. His love is stronger. Amen? And this restoration is the gift that comes through repentance. New life and ministry. New hope and healing for the lost. These are the results of repentance. You know, I'm always amazed, you know, when I see PKs who grow up hating the church, living in deep rebellion, when they find healing through Christ. I know of so many who have returned to Christ they enter seminary and they even begin ministry themselves. I have one friend uh, who also went through deep rebellious periods as a pastor's kid. And currently he's in seminary. Uh, God healed him, restored him. The, his relationship with his dad is like it was never even harmed. He has so much new love and respect. Uh, God restored so much through this relationship. And in fact, he's in pastoral, he's training for pastoral ministry. But the focus that he wants to have in ministry is on ministering to other PKs and MKs. Because he's been there. He knows what they've been through. And he wants to be a source of hope and love for them. That is a picture of restoration that the gospel brings. The hope that rep repentance brings. And it is a hope that comes only through the cross. So pray for a return. Pray for restoration. Ultimately, we want to pray for redemption. So everyone, everyone repeat, pray for redemption. Look at Luke 15, starting from verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came he drew, and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. And he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Now look at the language he uses in verse 30. But when this son of yours, so he disconnects association with his brother, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. He doesn't know that. Okay. He didn't follow his brother. He doesn't know how he uses money. But now he's just thinking of all the ways to slander his brother. He says, when this son of yours comes back, after he wasted your money on prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And look at the language and response of the father. Verse 31 and 32. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother. He is restoring proper relationship with his brother again. He says, this, your brother, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. It is language of not just restoration, but redeeming all that was lost. That his son and his, this brother was dead in many ways. But God has restored him. There is deep redemption language that is being pointed to here. And you see, the older son never ran away, but his heart was never really at home either. He was a son, but he lived like a slave. And that's how a lot of us live too. We are unable to celebrate the gift of life, adoption, and redemption because we still live as slaves, as if we must do, do, do in order to please God. That we feel so guilty because of our past that we still feel like we have to make it up to God and we are not celebrating the gift of grace and salvation. But we must remember that because we are now in Christ. Everything now serves a greater purpose in our lives. And all things 
can bring glory to the name of Jesus. Because God can not only restore, he can redeem all that we have been through. Because we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So when you are in Christ, all things can be redeemed. All things can be restored. All things can serve a greater purpose than its intended sinful results. Genesis 50, 20 says, You intended to harm me. These are the words of Joseph speaking to his brothers after they were reunited. You intended to harm me. What was done to me was sin. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God can even use sin against us to bring about a revolutionary, redemptive salvation for those who are lost. God now redeems all things in our lives, even sin, for the purpose of a Christ and for the glory of his name. And a life that understands this kind of redemption that happens to sinners who failed miserably before God and others. A life that understands redemption is a life that understands celebration. One of the most beautiful things about this parable, one of the most restorative and redemptive things about this parable is the celebration that is done, that is led by the Father at the repentance of his Son. You see, when one sinner repents, God throws a party in heaven. Celebration is a core cultural value of the kingdom of God. Amen? Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Song of Songs 2.4, he has taken me to the banquet hall and his banner over me is love. That is our God. He's a God who loves to run when we take one step back to him. He is a God who loves to throw a party in celebration when we repent of sins. One pastor said that the biggest challenge in his life is to believe that God really loved him. This is a challenge that a lot of us still face. Brennan Manning once said, if I'm not in touch with my own belovedness, meaning if I cannot truly believe that God loves me, then I cannot touch the sacredness of others. Experience has taught me that I, cannot, I, I connect best with others when I connect with the core of myself. When I allow God to liberate me from unhealthy dependence on people, I listen more attentively, love more unselfishly, and am more compassionate and playful. I take myself less seriously, become more aware that the breath of the Father is on my face and that my countenance is bright with laughter in the midst of the celebration and adventure called life that God has brought me on to thoroughly enjoy. That he came to understand that God is happy with me. God is happy when we realize we need him. Do you believe this? God is happy when we realize we need him. But we're so hard-headed many times, we don't realize we need God until we run away from him, until we rebel, until we lose it all. And unfortunately, we need to learn more oftentimes through our failures than our successes. You see, the gospel doesn't keep us from failing, but it transforms our failures into something that, become, that, that can become fruitful for our lives. That is redemption. Our failures do not define us. They refine us 
through faith in Christ. Amen? Everyone needs to be reminded of the gospel on a regular basis, even pastors. For the gospel reminds us that there is nothing that we could do to make, us, make God love us more. There is nothing that we could do to make God love us less. There was a saying that I once heard that when we stand before Jesus, he won't be looking for medals, he will be looking for scars. And I think there is a strong truth to that because you see, we are called as disciples to carry our crosses and follow him, not carry our pillows, which is what Christianity today often promises. Come to Jesus and life will be more comfortable. Come to Jesus, and you'll get a nice pillow to fall on. But the cross means suffering, pain, loss, and death. And those who still follow, who still trust, through suffering, through pain, through loss, through betrayal, through failure, through sin... Those who still follow. When we get everything the cross promises, we'll be found at the right place in the end. At the foot of the cross, desperate and depending on the Savior. So pray that pastors would trust in his redeeming power even as they go through the valley of the shadow of death, we may fail, but that does not define us. We may fail, but we are still loved. We may fail, but we are still accepted by God who has taken our failures and sins upon himself. We may fail, but we are forever honored as children of God. One more quote by Brennan Manning that I want to share with you. He says it well. He says, May all your expectations be frustrated. May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness that you may experience the powerlessness and the poverty of a child so that you will be able to sing and dance in the love and grace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, even in failure, no, especially in failure, may we fall into the hands of our gracious God who will not only catch us, he will hold us and restore us again. May we fall on our knees before the cross and know that this is the place before the cross where life and death meets where sin and redemption is transformed. May this place be the place where we understand where we belong because that is the place where true healing and restoration begins. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that with you, there is forgiveness. With you, there is healing. With you, there is redemption and restoration of things and lives and relationships lost. God, I ask that you would bring healing to relationships in this place today. Pains and sins absences and abuse. God, that you would mend, heal, restore in ways that we never could have even imagined possible. God, do what only you can do through your son's sacrifice of redeeming things lost things broken, things stolen away. Redeem them for your purposes as agents of grace 
to bring glory to your name. God, we also want to thank you that because of the work of Jesus, even the loss in this world amongst loved ones, that the loss in this world is not the end of the story, that because of Christ, there is resurrection. And because of Christ, there will be an eternal reunion. And we thank you for that gift. We thank you for that hope. Father, we thank you for the work of Jesus. So God, I pray for healing in this place today. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory without fault, without sin, without regret, but with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, Praise, worship, power, authority before all time. And be exalted now and forever. Amen.